Hi. Okay, so today uh, I am posting the uh, second section test uh, for Phil 101. It's due Monday, August 8th by 5 p.m. Um, basically exactly the same structure as the last one. I'll just go quickly through the boilerplate. Um, it, well, it's the section on section tests is, uh, well, it's, it's quite clear anyway. Um, you're responsible for both what you've read and uh, the videos and just sort of a more general understanding of the material at, 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 at hand. Uh, it's five questions. Um, so what did I do? Two on Aristotle, three on Hobbes. So um, it should be um, fairly straightforward there. Uh, if you're going to miss this assignment, please get in touch with me as soon as you realize you're going to miss this assignment. Uh, before the date in question is best, but after um, it's got to be within 12 hours, so by like 5 a.m. the next morning. But nonetheless, um, you should be able to manage that um, assignment submission. Um, it, it's your responsibility to make sure it's uploaded properly and the proper file is uploaded, um, especially in a quick semester like this. It's a fast turnaround on grading, so I can't be chasing after you for the correct file or what have you. Um, zero tolerance policy on plagiarism. Familiarize yourself with what plagiarism is. Um, I don't assume we're going to have any problems, uh, but nonetheless, um, it, so it's quote everything that you're getting from anywhere else and really this should be based on your own reflections on the material at hand. So you shouldn't need to go anywhere else um, for an understanding of this material. So um, I've got a zero tolerance policy um, which means that if I find that somebody is plagiarized you failed the course not just the test in question. So um, you can do the cost-benefit analysis and um, you see that it's just completely not in your favor to try and um, do that. Right? So uh, readings, Aristotle, Nicomachean Ethics, Book 1, Book 2, and Section 1 of Book 3. Um, you've got video material that relates to all of that. Hobbes, Leviathan, chapters 6 to 19. I know that was a lot of reading, but um, chapters 6 through 10 are basically definitions, which I go over in the videos. So um, it's it, generally the meat of the argument is chapters 13, 14, 16, and 17. Um, those are the ones to really concentrate on. Otherwise, you can just, just as long as you've got the definitions for things and see the way that the argument works together, uh, you should be fairly okay. And um, what's more, I direct you um, to specific uh, sections of the text in uh, these questions. So um, nonetheless, it's so, um, so short answer questions, um, you're responsible for the vi video material as well, um, my Aristotle video, um, Aristotle's Ethics Part 1, the, uh, the, the podcast lectures there, School of Life Philosophy Aristotle, my Hobbes video, um, the School of Life Political Theory Hobbes. So those are the videos. It's sort of a short list of videos um, that I've given you here. So um, you should be able to handle that. Um, uh, roughly a paragraph or two for each response to these questions. Um, full sentences are necessary. It, it, it point form I have to interpret. And if I'm interpreting, you're not being clear. And remember, this is supposed to be a course that generates your ability to communicate effectively about ideas in writing, right? So clearly and effectively. So I shouldn't have to do too, too much interpreting. Um, so four points each, total of 20 points. Uh, first two on Aristotle, uh, then the next three on Hobbes. Um, basically, I've asked you a question on book one and a question on book two of the Nicobachean Ethics. Um, these should be fairly straightforward. Uh, the first one reads, briefly discuss the function argument uh, discussed by Aristotle in book one of the Nicobachean Ethics. And that's so basically give me an outline of that argument. Um, I'm pretty clear about this. I use examples um, in my video lecture as well um, of all things that have a function. The good for that thing can be determined in terms of that function and how do we achieve the good to perform our function well that is in accordance with Virto. 
virtue, you know, da, 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 da. For that first part, um, perhaps an example would be good, um, but make sure your example exemplifies what you're trying to exemplify um, clearly. So um, it's just, just a slight word of caution there, but examples to illustrate are very helpful when um, discussing it, it generally um, an argument like this. Um, keep in mind, though, that Aristotle is looking uh, for something much deeper than just performing a task well. I give you task-oriented examples in the video. I right? a good carpenter is somebody who is able to produce things out of wood well. Right? So the virtue of the comp carpenter is that um, it, it, it's his skill is in, at carpentry. Um, Aristotle's looking for a human function, that is a more general understanding of what it means to be human and uh, sort of a methodology to be a good human being. So a good human being is one who um, lives his life in accord with virtue. How, by the, this argument, does Aristotle arrive at a definition of happiness? Now, remember from book one, um, he went through the three lives, which annoyingly discusses four lives, um, and each of those failed to suffice as a definition of happiness. The function argument is where Aristotle goes next to define happiness. Happiness is, of course, an, an activity of the soul in accord with virtue. Right. So the function argument is linked to the conclusion of the function argument is that definition of virtue. Right. So um, how does Aristotle get from function to virtue is what I'm asking you to make clear in the second part of this question. So um, hopefully that's that's nice and clear for you. Um, Question two. In book two of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle defines virtue of character and describes or discusses how it's developed. So what I want you to do is define virtue of character. And, and this is the specific virtue of character as distinct from virtue of thought or intellectual virtue. And, um, it, Aristotle oscillates, so I oscillate in the terms virtue of character is moral virtue, whereas Virtue of thought is intellectual virtue. I'm just asking you to engage with virtue of character. Right? And I gave you lots of examples there. Um, so define it. And briefly discuss how it's developed. Right? How do we develop it? Right? Well, he tells it's, it's not from reading a book that we develop virtue of character. Right? So the nature of virtue suggests how we develop virtue. Right? It's the same way we get to Carnegie Hall. All right. Um, and then um, in Book 2, Section 4 of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle identifies three requirements for genuine virtue. And I even quote a section of it here, but surely actions are not enough. Page 22. Briefly discuss each of these three requirements. Note that this isn't just list them, tell me what Aristotle means by them. And, and it's sort of a hint of why he would bother to add them. So that's Aristotle. And I hope you liked Aristotle. I very much like Aristotle. Um, it's, I consider him one of the most important Western philosophers, like ever. Right? I, I, I've I've heard conspiracy theorists go as, uh, so far as to argue that Aristotle might be an alien because um, of just just the productivity of Aristotle. He invented metaphysics. He coined the term. Um, he it, it basically defined. Logic and only in the past 150 years have we gotten beyond Aristotle's logic right? and on top of that physics is He was the authoritative figure in terms of physics and he's got a fairly stout virtue ethics position I tend to think I like this book. So um, I hope you did too um, now on to Hobbes, and as I say in the videos, now for something completely different. Uh, if you see, the ancient philosophers were puppy dogs and ice cream, happiness, love, justice, that sort of thing, and had an assumption about humans that we were all basically good creatures. Right? And that really the trick to being a human being is to understand the underlying goodness of human beings and express it. 
All right? They've got this chocolatey center that is basically good. Evil is a privation. All right? Whereas Hobbes, he doesn't think we're evil per se. In fact, he obliterates the definition of evil by actually reducing it to um, the appetite and aversion. Right? Evil is just what we don't like. Right? So um, Hobbes doesn't think we're evil. He just thinks we're selfish and self-interested. So three questions on Hobbes. Hobbes introduces a rather bleak account of human nature and describes the natural condition of mankind in detail. Right? Briefly introduce each, followed by a discussion of how, according to Hobbes, the state of nature, right, or the natural condition of mankind, arises as a consequence of his account of human nature. So, um, basically this question is a sandwich. Here are human beings, here is our natural condition. How does our, our human nature lead us naturally into a condition of war as is of everyone against everyone? All right. um, it's a fairly intricate and neat argument from Hobbes, and if you give him his theory of human nature, it's pretty clear that we're going to wind up in the state of nature. If we really are these desire-driven creatures led by appetite and aversion that um, seek after power after power. Remember, it's our restless and ceaseless desire that ends only in their death. All right, page 161 if you're looking for that. Um, anyhow, um, so it, it, that's, that should be a fairly straightforward um, kind of question. All right? Here are human beings. Here's how human beings behave in a situation with no 911 to call, with no state to protect us from each other. All right? There's, and um, he's got, uh, God, I want to say it's on 189. My old copy of this book just no no it's 181 183 185 do, 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 do. yeah no 186 yeah, my old copy of the book the page used to fall straight out because it's um so oft quoted a passage whatsoever therefore is consequent of a time of war where every man is enemy to every man the same is consequent to the time wherein men live with without other security than what their own strength and their own invention shall furnish them withal in such a condition there is no place for industry because the fruit thereof is uncertain and, the con and consequently no culture of the earth, no navigation, nor use of commodities that may be imported by sea, no commodious building, no instruments of moving and removing such things as require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and, which is worst of all, continual fear and, no, and danger of violent death. And the life of my man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Basically, what I'm asking you in that first Hobbes question is, how do we get there? Right? What kind of beings are we that this is our natural condition, according to Hobbes? Just follow the argument. Right? Um, question four. We're almost done. Right? Chapter 14, um, Hobbes distinguishes between the right of nature and the laws of nature. Define each. And it, I, I want to be really clear, chapter 15 lays out like a ton of laws of nature. It starts to sound like contract law. Why? Because basically it is, it, it is it's the idea of a social contract. Remember your Socrates, right? Um, but nonetheless, I just need like maybe the first and maybe the second law of nature is illustrations, right? Um, but nonetheless, distinguish between the right of nature and the laws of nature. Define each. All right. In the same section, Hobbes introduces the idea of a covenant. Right. Why are covenants important to Hobbes' argument? Now, here I'm asking you to think more generally. After you define the right of nature and the laws of nature, tell me what a covenant is and ask in sort of a larger scheme of things in terms of Hobbes why covenants are important. And here is a big hint for you. 
Right? This is why it's important to watch these videos. He calls them convenient articles of peace. They're the way out of the state of nature. How so? All right. So um, anyhow, that's question number four. All right. And then finally, question number five. Since we're talking about covenants, Discuss the covenant that uh, gives rise to the commonwealth introduced by Hobbes in chapter 17, being sure to cite the covenant itself found on page 227. Now, you know, page 227, it's, you can see it there, it's highlighted, right? So I want you to quote this right at the beginning of your answer. That's like a point, right? You get one point for just quoting. I authorize and give up my right to govern myself to this man or to this assembly of men on this condition that thou give up thy right to him and authorize all his actions in like manner. Quote that. Put it there. That's a free point. All right. Um, I like it there so that you can refer to it, that I can refer to it. It helps the clarity of your writing. If you're going to talk about the covenant that gives rise to the commonwealth, you should quote the com com uh, covenant that gives rise to the commonwealth. All right. So this is the root of the social contract. Now, briefly discuss how this covenant, which establishes sovereign, sovereign power, breaks down the distinction between public and private good in the person of the sovereign. Now, in the later chapters, and I go into this in the video, Hobbes actually discusses why a sovereignty, right, a sovereign com a commonwealth with one ruler is better than a, an, a, an assembly or a democracy, right? In the person of the sovereign, right, you have all of the power. Right. So ideally, this is this is why it, we're expecting this Commonwealth Agreement to work. Who is trustworthy enough to wield this power? It's all the power right, in the hands of one person. Well, the problem is giving one person that much power. There's only one thing that you can trust them to do, which is act in their own self interest. Right? So this commonwealth is designed to harness the self-interest of one individual and have it produce the greater good. Right? So um, th that, that is the discussion that um, I'm asking you to enter into. Um, I realize that this is a somewhat difficult exam, right? but um, I give you these questions because I think you can do it. And it's um, you've you've got all of the resources. Um, you've engaged with the material. Um, you've got me. If you're faltering and not sure how to respond to these questions, you've got me. You can email me, and we can have a discussion about the questions and about the theory behind them. Um, so if you have any questions about this assignment, um, please just let me know, um, and I'm here to help. And on top of that. Um, it, just do your best, and actually, I, I'm sure you can do it. All right? Well, you guys have good days, one for each of you, and I'll look forward to reading your, um, your assignments after August 8th um, by 5 p.m. That's Monday. All right? Thank you.